We get a lot of questions about the geological significance of pre-stacktonic migration velocities. And it's a difficult uh, thing to address because uh, we, we violate a lot of the assumptions inherent to pre-stacktonic migration when we do imaging in complex structured land areas. But I, I'm going to try to address uh, some of the issues around illumination uh, with RMS velocities. Basically, the fundamental principle here is that what RMS velocities are doing is averaging through the near surface along the illumination direction. So PSTM velocity, PSTM uses RMS or average velocity down to each imaging point. The PSTM velocity is a processing parameter that may not correlate with the geological or petrophysical parameters. PSTM velocity is dependent on reflector dip because it the averaging happens along the illumination direction. Here's an example that uh, shows this uh, averaging phenomenon. If we consider the subthrust structure in brown in the deep section here, to the right we've got low velocity rocks above the target. On the left we've got high velocity rocks thrust to surface on a major overthrust. Now on the top of the structure we can illuminate the top of that structure with a, the seismic experiment with rays that only pass through the low velocity strata. So the average velocity down to that reflector is, is just basically going to be the velocity in the beige here, in the tan area. However, if we go just a little bit to the left over the crest of the structure and the, and the back limb of this structure, the rays that illuminate that part of the structure come from the uh, surface locations in the overthrust. So we'll, have, we'll see a high velocity, a high RMS velocity on this side of the structure and a low RMS velocity on this side of the structure. Now, this is uh, in this example, we've got uh, homogeneous, uh, you know, just the tan uh, rocks are above the target, and yet we would pick a high RMS velocity here and a low RMS velocity here in order to optimize the imaging. So the velocity field is going to show this lateral variation that is really not there in the uh, in the subsurface geology, that it's just the imaging parameter that we've used to optimize the imaging. Okay, let's think about vertical, the vertical effects here, uh, and think about interval velocities. The interval velocity calculation uh, is based on the assumption of a horizontal reflector beneath a homogeneous overburden, and that's that assumption is violated here, and we'll show you how that how the violation impacts the calculation of the interval velocity. If we consider Imaging a back thrust above the target. Here's our reflector running across there. Just like we saw in the previous example, the rays that illuminate this structure uh, all pass through the low velocity material. So we're just going to see a, a low RMS velocity down to that reflector. 100 milliseconds below, or some small interval below that, if we're if we're imaging the the back crest of this structure, like in the previous example those rays that illuminate that part of the structure are going to pass through the overthrust and we'll see a higher average RMS velocity to that imaging point. Now, if we uh, are using the Dix equation and assuming these horizontal reflectors and, and a homogeneous overburden, um, then we will get quite an anomalous interval velocity calculation because we have the low RMS interval velocity at, in the blue square here and below that we will get a high RMS velocity. If we assume that we've got these horizontal layers and, uh, and a homogeneous overburden, then, uh, then the cumulative average velocity down to the blue is going to be some low number, and then we'll have a much higher number and the cumulative average down to the red, and so that the interval velocity resulting from that is going to have to be significantly high in order to, to have the cumulative average increase significantly over that interval. So it will result in this extreme interval velocity. So there are many cases where, where we calculate interval velocities and, um, and they end up with these extreme values. And I'll show you an example of that on some seismic data. This is a classic example of a Foothills data set. Fairly high signal to noise, relatively speaking, and fairly gentle structures. We've just basically got this broad anticline syncline pair going through here. Notice in the velocity map here in the core of this anticline uh, 
we've got a slightly lower velocity, more yellowy hues to the velocity map than the orange on either side of the limbs of the anticline. And, uh, and over on the right at the base of the syncline, we've got more reddish hues as we've got higher velocity at the base of the syncline, high RMS velocity. And the reason for this is anisotropy. We've actually got fairly homogeneous overburden. These are all kind of the same rock layers that run across the, the, uh, the section here. But we, in, in a dipping classic overburden, we've got a higher velocity in the direction parallel to bedding and a lower velocity in the direction perpendicular to bedding. And that bedding is uh, orientation is, is changing as we go along the section. So now if we think about imaging, uh, and the core of the anticline, the ray paths are going to run along directions fairly close to normal to bedding, or the lowest uh, direction, the lowest velocity direction. And then if we think about if we wanted to image the base of the syncline, then these uh, the rays are going to, uh, to image this uh, subsurface reflector at angles oblique to bedding, or a higher RMS velocity. So that kind of makes sense then as to why we would see this uh, gentle variation of RMS velocity if, as we try to pick these, uh, the optimum imaging at each of these imaging points. And you can see there is definitely some variation within those layers, but it's a fairly, fairly subtle, fairly gentle variation. Uh, however, when we calculate interval velocity across these intervals, uh, we can see we've definitely got lots of little uh, little squares that are uh, a, a lot more extreme in the highs and lows across the section. And so we don't expect these interval velocities to really give us much, or trust this to, to give us much evidence as to, as to how the lithology is behaving. We really need uh, depth imaging uh, where we build a geological model in order, to, uh, in order to have the correlation between velocities and, um, and geology. So just to summarize, RMS velocity is a processing parameter that averages through the effects of seismic heterogeneity and anisotropy in the, in the overburden above the reflector. Lateral and vertical variation in RMS velocity is dependent on the illumination angle and the reflector dip. Interval velocity calculation is based on the assumption of horizontal, laterally homogeneous layering which is a rare case in the foothills type setting. Variation in RMS velocity may result in wildly inaccurate interval velocities. Even on this gentle case we just looked at, we can see that we wouldn't trust those interval velocities to be geological.